Hello, Sermon Brainwave listeners and viewers. This is Matt Skinner inviting you to join Caroline, Joy, and me at Ghost Ranch Retreat Center, August 11 through 15, 2025. We led a similar preacher's retreat last summer, and it was a huge hit. This one will include presentations and workshops, worship, and lectionary-based study, all designed to enhance your gifts as a biblical preacher. And you'll be nourished by the awe-inspiring landscape of the high desert near Santa Fe, New Mexico. Visit Working Preacher's homepage and click on the link under Preacher's Retreat for more details. Sign up today. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. Our text for the 19th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on September 29th, 2024, is Numbers chapter 11, verses 4 through 6, verses 10 through 16, and verses 24 through 29. Or the semi-continuous reading takes us to Esther chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, 9 through 10, and then chapter 9, verses 20 and 22. Our psalm is Psalm 19, verses 7 through 14. Our epistle is James 5, chapter uh, chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. And our gospel this week is the ninth chapter of Mark, reading verses 38 through 50. Okay. Another difficult text from Mark. I know. That's what I was just about to say. But I think yeah, an no, important yeah. one, too. Yes. Mm-hmm. I think an important one also. Oh, gosh. We've been talking about greatness and misunderstanding of divine power and embracing human power. And- mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Partiality, yep. divisiveness. Mm-hmm. This, mm-hmm. One, this one draws us right in. Um, we're, the, we're, we're your followers. We're the end cast. We, we saw someone who's not a part of us doing the very things that you have asked us to do. And they were successful. This is so, it, it, it's, it's a hard word because this is so much where we are right now. Um, mm-hmm. We don't respect folks who call themselves followers of Christ because they fit in a category that we would rather other. And mm-hmm. you fill in that divisiveness in any way. And that's what makes this text a living word and a hard one for us, because Jesus' response is, no one who does a deed of power in the name of Jesus is soon after going to be able to curse him, to speak evil of him. What is, what is this about? Is this about our greatness and our power? Or, as Caroline is going to say to us eventually today, is this about glorifying God. Mm -hmm. Well, and then the way, oh, go ahead, Matt. No, no, it's all good. I was just going to confess my sins, but you go ahead. Oh, no, I want to hear your confession of sin. No, what Joy just said, that's the hardest thing for me. What? Well, I, I, I I think the hardest thing is about being (laughs) Christian. Come on. I think it's very hard to pray for your enemies. I think it's also really, really hard to, um, to widen that circle and to admit yeah. that certain people who claim to be Christian might, actually might be. really be on the same team as me, even though I don't recognize any kind of commonality. You know, it's just hard. And I, this has gotten harder for me in the last, uh, well, I don't know, let's just say eight, nine, 10 years. If yeah. I wanted to anyway, offer you some I have no absolute- wisdom. I'm just confessing my sins here to the public. If I wanted to offer you some absolution, Matt, I I, I want to say the way that this is worded, there is recognition that what they're doing looks like what Jesus is asking them to do. But because they were on the other side, there was a denial. And that's a little different than I say what we've been talking about in as we've been looking through James the last few weeks, where what is shown if not matching what is spoken. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give you a little absolution on that portion of your confession. And I think also at the end of verse 39, Jesus is partly saying, and don't worry, that guy will come around eventually. Like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) like he is a little rogue, you know, but don't worry. 
mm-hmm. but his he'll come around. <laughs> mm-hmm. In other words, mm-hmm. <laughs> God forbid I need to push, come around, but yeah. If we don't push him out, I mean, I think I think about uh, you guys know I love Harry Potter, and I spend a whole lot of time looking at how uh, the Harry Potter series actually uh, reveals a whole lot of things about hospitality and a lot of things about. Um, facing struggles and building community of trust, trusted friends, et cetera. And um, there are so many ways which in the past and in the present, we can ignore that on the left and on the right, because we don't agree with the writer of the book. And so we ignore the truths that are in this wonderful story, because we'd rather spend more time talking about that person that we other. Yeah, I think also it's really interesting that the, you know, do not stop him for no one who does a deed of power in my name will will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. And so, but then verse 41, 42, 43, and so forth, it's, I find it so interesting that the deeds of power then are cast in that way. Yes. Right. So, so teacher, we saw someone casting out demons. I mean, that seems like a that's powerful, pretty, pretty obvious display of power, right? You're gonna, and it and it goes back to right Jesus first, uh, Jesus first act in the Gospel of Mark, which is an exorcism, right? Goes back to that demonstration of 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 Jesus authority over even, you know, even the evil powers, the demonic powers. That is, that's an obvious demonstration of power. Giving a cup of water <laughs> or, you know, a, a, how is it that, uh, how is it that we are, you know, how is it that we are using that power? Are we using it to uh, create stumbling blocks? Are we ignoring the needs of others? Um, if you know, are you aware of how the different things that you do actually work against you know the foot, the, working against uh, what you claim, what we claim God's power to be, and so that 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 is also a really interesting move for me on Jesus' part that that it, you don't necessarily expect that. <laughs> to go into okay, how is this? How does this power get used, and where do we see it? Um, and so that that contrast between the, you know, the casting out demons and then these um, these acts of of uh, well, yeah, these acts of not in, of of what power what power looks like and doesn't make like, curious. What what happens when you've said the right words and you walk away from the opportunity to help a person in need? Mm-hmm. Um, what happens when you've said the right words and you, um, uh, your hand physically hurts someone else or you look lustfully or covetanting in a way? You know, it, it, these, these mirror um, the, uh, uh, the, the expectations of the Ten Commandments uh, in that harsh way that Matthew's, the, the, the words that are recorded in Matthew from Jesus do. But this is Mark's way. Uh, for me, I read this. This is hard. You know, you know my eye, my, my ear causes me to stop my eye. My, my, my foot causes me to stumble. My eye ca- yeah, It's like, oh my goodness. I said all the right things, didn't I? Mm. But are you living in a way that bears witness to that righteousness. That's what I read in these words from, from Mark. I think it's really important that Phil Ruge Jones in his commentary talks about how Jesus is still apparently holding a child. Yes. Oh, yes, all of yes. This, which will help you read it differently. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And as well, that line, verse 42, if any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me or who have trust in me, another way we could translate mm-hmm. that, He's talking about children and their vulnerability. And so part of what's going on here is he's so deeply concerned about exploitation and manipulation Mm -hmm. and taking advantage of the powerless in a whole host of ways. 
And that again, transfers into a lot. Again, if we're going to keep talking about power, misuse of power, misuse of all of these things. So before people say, why is he being so harsh about talking about self-mutilation and fires of hell? <laughs> we've got to get at who's he trying to protect and what kinds of things is he worried about? I think that's really essential. We haven't really talked about Gehenna here or hell mm. and how to deal with these parts of the passage that are going to stick to people when it's read, even before the sermon begins. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I did some work on Matthew recently, published a little book about it, but I, I part of, and having you tried to deal that. with, well, trying to deal with some of these things. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that the, I'm not sure I believe in kind of the traditional understanding of hell as a place where you go to get punished and are tormented forever and ever and ever. But I do believe that the way Jesus talks about judgment is the need to rid the world of abuses, unnecessarily abusers, but abuses. Now, again, you can't, <laughs> not sure how much you can separate an abuser out. from an abuse, and that's up to God to decide, not me. But, but there is something, the seriousness here is rooted in a desire to change the world so the world or so human society can be safe mm -hmm. for the people who have no recourse to legal protection, to any kind of protection. And so you have to see the love that's connected to the judgment, right? The deep concern for the vulnerable that's attached mm -hmm. to judgment. And you have to recognize that some of this is hyperbolic, that some of this is right. meant to get your attention. Some of this right. is meant to get you, to shock you. And of course it does that. But, but be, before you decide to preach a sermon on hell or whether or not hell exists or what it looks like and how much it may, may not you know, be like certain places you've lived, um, but to get at where is the compassion here? Where is the heart of Jesus in this? And it has to begin with the child on his lap or the children around him, I think. I and agree I, with that. I, yeah, I, I'm really glad you mentioned that because I wanted to bring that up as well. And that was, that was such an important, I mean, obvious observation. <laughs> I mean, it seems like that's what's happening, but it's so important to remember. And then to go, uh, the, that last line of the commentary then kind of, I think for me, puts a lot of what we're talking about, centralizes it. But just as often we, like John, simply lose track of those whom Jesus has put in the center of community. And uh, we become distracted by competition or our own status and if you translate that and out into what we've already been talking about, who, who, who are we choosing not to see who is sitting on Jesus' lap? Uh, because we're too busy, uh, we're too busy in our status of you know, our figuring out our status or our competition. Or, well, what does that mean for me? Why am I not there? Why am I not? You know, um, but to step back and say, yeah, where, how is it that we are then? actively engaged in some of these behaviors that are representative of a, a kind of place, whether that's, you know, hell or not, but representative of a way of being that is antithetical to the kingdom of God. Yeah. You now maybe that's hell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a, state, the it's a state of being, it's a way of being that, that works against uh, what Jesus has put before us. Oh, it's a place without the presence of God, the peace of God, uh, the mercy of God, the justice of God, the hospitality of God. Um, when all of that is absent, um, you're living in hell, wherever that is. And it, it might be a zip code you actually occupy. Um, and then why is that zip code a place that is so devoid of hospitality and justice. Do we have a hand in that, uh, in, in our greatness that we want to flaunt? Um, I appreciate um, Matt's reminder in terms of the imagery uh, rhetorically that is being um, pushed here. Uh, I remember the first time I saw an actual millstone and to realize how huge, I mean, I'm from the city. I didn't see, you know, grain being milled. I, I had no idea. But to see that, I'm like, oh my goodness, 
I thought Jesus was serious when he started talking about cutting off your foot or cutting out your eye. That first image, Jesus is serious. This is what I'm going to throw you. Oh, my goodness. And that is what is repeatedly um, rhetorically emphasized in this text. And maybe in our preaching, that should be what we center on, rather than um, um, abruptly diverting the conversation to, uh, you know, what are, what are our beliefs about hell? You know, let's, let's talk about what are our beliefs about living with others here and now in the name yeah. of Jesus. Wait till you see my video on Instagram about this passage. <laughs> All right. I'm going well, to a millstone. A preacher Did to preach. you? I'm, I'm, I have plans. <laughs> <laughs> I believe there's one in Minneapolis, if it's still there. Okay. All right. All right. Great. Anyway, Great. sorry, I'm plugging all sorts of stuff today. Yeah, let's do yeah. it. We have videos on Instagram. 90 seconds. Yep. Sorry, Caroline, you're going to say something about the Bible. No, I, no, I was going <laughs> to say preacher to preacher, our preacher to preacher moments. Preacher to moments. We should move on. Numbers. Yeah. Esther. Psalm. Um, I'm I'm going to say just a little something about uh, about numbers, and then I do want to say something about Esther. Um, but I'm struck by the boundaries of the numbers text this week, the, uh, and the commentary references this. They're in genuine need. They they need sus- substance right now. Uh, they are genuinely in a liminality between what was. And what is yet to be, what has been promised to them. And I, I think it's interesting that the response is a prophetic word. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I'll say something about Moses in a moment. Um, uh, but what is a prophetic word in the midst of people complaining about a real need? And, and, in some ways, the texts we've been reading the last few weeks, which are centered on hospitality, on who Jesus centers, might very well be, let's stop our navel gazing so that we can be concerned for others. And that's exactly what Moses does. I mean, yes, Moses is upset. Yes, Moses is complaining. But Moses is also standing between God and the people here. Mm-hmm. And that's the role of a leader, mm-hmm. to stand between God and the people. Mm-hmm. When the people are complaining about God and when God is complaining about the people, the priestly prophetic pastoral role is to stand in that gap. I don't know. I kind of get, I would miss the leeks and the onions and the garlic too. I get it. <laughs> I like all those things a lot. Especially leeks. Leeks are so good. Anyway. Yeah. And I what think- is manna anyway? <laughs> <laughs> That's all really good, Joy. I, I I confess a lot of the times with the uh with the um thematic Old Testament reading, I'm kinda like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you know what I mean? From, <laughs> like it doesn't always supplement the gospel super well yeah. or and this mm-hmm. is one that's a really interesting pairing for me because mm-hmm. of that because it's kind of like, well, what is Moses going to do in this situation of real seriousness and with people mm-hmm. to protect? And in this case, maybe even protect from God, or at least mm-hmm. they need a voice from God. And then you've got Eldad and Medad. And I mean, there's a lot going on in the numbers text. There's really good commentary as well by David Garber. Yes. Um, but it's, it raises questions about like leadership, but also he has this great line. David Garber has this great line about Moses caught between a weeping people and an angry God. God. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And that's part of what's going on with the child on Jesus' lap. Mm. I'm not sure I'd say God is angry, but God is saying, I'm not going to, I love these kids too much. Let them live in a predatory world, you know? And so something's got to happen. Um, mm. And what's the response to that? The response to that is way more nuanced than cut off your arm, right? It's right. let's find ways to hear God's spirit. Let's find ways, let's petition to God on behalf of the people. You know what I mean? That, that there's... Yeah the attention getting rhetoric of Jesus is offset a bit by Moses with a real plan that actually really empowers people. Right. 
in the midst of this, so it doesn't turn into the Moses show or to the Aaron show or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, be a long sermon and a bit of a complicated one, but I can see some interesting back and forth there. Uh, Esther or the Psalm? Well, the Psalm's just great. Just read that. I, I, yeah, uh, Psalm. Yeah, exactly. Sorry. Uh, no, it does complement the numbers text pretty well. And it does. It does. Yeah, it does very much so. And, and the gospel text. So <laughs> but we want to talk about Esther, don't we? I do Esther. want to talk about Esther, but yes. I'll, I'll say this about the Psalm because um, to turn the attention of, of the people of God to responding to the decrees of God with respect and deference. Um, th- this is um, th- like the 119th Psalm. This is a Psalm that favors the word of God, and, and several of the Psalms do. Um, but in our culture, um, anywhere around the globe, uh, we need the people of God to again be a peculiar practicing community that demonstrates bearing false witness against your enemies or longing for some great day in the past. If this God's future is it w- worth waiting for or just living the decrees rather than talking about them. This is this we need the world needs that kind of practicing community. And I think this psalm respects and defers to the word of God in that way. And I think it also uh the very famous verse that many preachers use Psalm uh 19, Guilty. 19 right? Uh, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Um, I, I I say this with some frequency, but when you have those kinds of, when you have those uh, those moments in in scripture that are are that we quote all the time, but people don't. Oh, that's where that's from. <laughs> Right. You know, oh, you say that every Sunday, Pastor. Or we, I hear, my, I hear my, you know, I hear my preacher say that every Sunday, or you know, almost every Sunday. And yet, uh, and then here is where it's from. So it become it also can become an opportunity to put those words on the lips of all of all of the people and say, what do we mean when we say that? And and particularly some of the themes that how you know that the words of our mouth are and the meditation of our hearts are our extensions should be of in what way do they glorify God? So yeah, that would be and not, thing. and not just when we are about to preach a 12 minute sermon yeah. or when we gather together for 59 minutes, right? but right. literally as we live our lives 24 yes. seven. Mm-hmm. Thanks for Esther. that. Yay. Yeah, here's your one shot at Esther. That's and, it. Uh, take, it, take it. Take it. This is this is this is such a powerful story. Mm-hmm. Um, a powerful reflection of God preserving God's people. If 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 Esther's not successful here, or maybe I should say, if Mordecai is not successful here, then God's faithfulness is nullified because God's promise to the people are gone. Um, because the people would have been destroyed. So I would say enable your listeners to notice the timing of this swift response to Esther's request. This isn't the first banquet. This isn't the first gathering. Um, this is um, chapter seven, and we she's been um, told the situation uh, from outside of her place. Uh, in the in the um, palace by her uncle, um, uh, been made aware of the situation. Uh, she's had to be convinced that she actually is in the place where she could make a difference. I, all of that backstory is before we get to this. So Esther throws a party, has the has the king's. Um, he likes uh, being there, and he says, "Hey, whatever you want, just ask me for it." She asks, and he gives it to her. But boom, it's not that kind a story. And what does that mean for us when we are waiting on God's fulfilled promise? And maybe we've been placed, to use the familiar line, in this position for such a time as this, but that such a time is not the final banquet. Mm -hmm. It's actually the three banquets before that lead to and make it possible for the king to say, 
wait a minute, who's messing with my people? Okay, I love this text. (laughs) Agreed, all, yeah. I mean, it's a a clearly, it's a wonderful opportunity to preach on Esther. And it's the only time it occurs. It's the only time, yeah. Yeah, It's so hard because you've got to preach the whole story and you just got a little... But you could also, you know, you are free to find time to carve out four weeks and mm-hmm. give Esther its due. What a thought. What a Just thought. Saying. You can oh, do it any time oh. of the year. I wouldn't do it during Advent or, you know, Easter, but, you know, you can yeah, do it other times of the year. Mm-hmm. 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 It's one of those things where people are like, wow, that's in the Bible? Like that kind of like political farce, but also deeply serious. And it's, there's just mm-hmm. a lot mm-hmm. going on there theologically and ethically. And, mm-hmm. Do it. Yes. Okay. James, last one of James. This is the we last have made one. it through James. And if you've been preaching through James, this uh, these last sort of uh, exhortations, uh, practical in, in, in many ways of the way in which uh, the way in which the author voices, you know, what how to how to connect with God, right? In these in these situations of suffering, pray, cheerful, sing songs. <laughs> um, so we have these, uh, yeah, these ending words that are uh, that are a way in which call us back to um, call us back to the the activities of faith that that enable us in many respects to do uh, to live the way James is asking us to live. Uh, and so prayer, singing songs, um, prayer of faith will save the sick. I mean, those are, I think those are the, it's calling us back to those daily realities of, of how is it possible then to, to do the works of faith, to, you know, to live as how he's called us to do. So what do you think about adding verses? I'm always for adding verses. Really? Yeah. What do you want to add? What do you want to add? It feels wrong to me to end with verses 13 forward if we've skipped over 5, 1 through 6, mm. even 5, 1 through 11. I mean, but 5, mm. 1 through 6 are some of the hardest verses in the whole New Testament to read, mm. right? It's, Come now, you rich, weep and wail for the miseries that are coming to you. I mean, it's... it's um, Yeah, good point. True. Yeah. And maybe I'm just causing trouble here, but it's the ending parts of James are are beautiful and the, everything you just said, Caroline is true. But mm-hmm. I mean, it talks about like withholding wages from laborers who have done honest work for you. You lived on the earth in luxury and in pleasure. You fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. I mean, it's, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the, <sighs> yeah, I get that. I mean, this is part of James, right? James is, it is one of the reasons why James is so, difficult and focused on how you live is because James is so worried that the poor are going to get mistreated. Yes. And it's so worried that church people are going to be among the wealthy and the privileged who mistreat the poor. Yes. And if there's a worry in James about grace being a little too easy, a little too free, it's because the author of James seems to know the first people to pay the price for that are going to be the powerless. And so- like Esther, that's this has got to be preached sometime. I don't know if this yeah. is the week for it, but yeah, yeah. And I say that as somebody who's in a squarely in a Protestant tradition who believes in justification by grace through faith, very, very much. I don't think what James is saying is antithetical to that. No. James is saying, "Show me." Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's a mm-hmm. different and way I, of thinking theologically, but anyway. Sorry, I don't. Yeah, I, yeah I no, like I. Off the rails. No, I don't think so. I absolutely appreciate that because that truly is the context. That truly is the context of the whole of, of this letter of James Mm -hmm. and to miss that. um, So I, I'm I'm guilty of uh, staying within the text this time um, (laughs) because I like, yeah, because I, I like to be able to admit that uh, I don't believe in the power of prayer. I believe in the actions of the one to whom we pray. So Caroline, as you opened this up, you were talking about singing praise to God, being in conversation with God. And uh, sometimes in the rhetoric that I hear, you know, we talk about prayer and we talk about praying, we talk about um, 
the worship itself as if that is what is working. And the reality is, as you opened us up, this is a means for us to be in relationship, in conversation, um, acknowledge our worship to God. And so uh, if I stay within the text, that's the point I'm going to want to turn us to. But if I stay within the letter, then I definitely need to hear what Matt has said to us and encourage us to maybe... Maybe not teach uh, Esther this week, but uh, since we've been doing James, go ahead and finish out that true practice of hospitality and concern for the outcast that James is concerned about. Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org slash brainwave. And be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.